This lecture is on the nature of knowledge, uh, contemporary epistemology, and the traditional theory of knowledge. Pushing the problem of skepticism aside now, um, it seems pretty clear that the word knowledge or to know can mean a number of different things, right? So we have uh, basic cases of knowledge, like you know that you can see your own hands, that you know what things were in the refrigerator or how to make a sandwich. But then there's also scientific cases of knowledge, right? Really complicated cases like knowing, uh, you know, about gravity, how to calculate the orbit of planets, or you know what's going on at the biological or subatomic level. Um, experimental data sometimes seems to count as certain kinds of scientific knowledge. And then there's um, you know things that are proven by science versus things that are conjectured. And so there's this sort of leveling understanding of what things in science we count as actually knowing and things that you know just seem to be suggested by the science but we don't really know them um, and then there's you know people talk about uh, mystical or mythical uh, knowledge of certain sorts where we've got you know people like priests or mystics or psychics or uh, you know uh, Buddhist monks maybe they have some kind of deep connection to the ether or to God or to you know the afterlife or something like that now the way that we use the word knowledge um, in as far as I can tell is actually in some ways a problem for general generic skepticism uh, about everything and the reason here well, is a little bit, I think, subtle, but bear with me. First, you know, mystical knowledge, things, you know, we say that people have this, like, deep understanding of reality or or connection with God. These kinds of bits of information are kind of hard to prove, right? So it's if someone, you know, says that they can tell the future, you can ask them how they're doing it, and they don't really seem to be able to show you. Um, so here, when it comes to things like mystical knowledge, it seems like you know general skepticism of the practice m might be justified, right? It seems pretty justified. Um, scientific knowledge, right? The the way what we talk about when we talk about doing science, it's always kind of hard to understand uh, what the knowledge is and hard to understand how it is that people have gone about accumulating that knowledge. There's lots of room for disagreement in science, and there's lots of kind of um, difficulty in checking and proving scientific data. And so because of this sort of difficulty in sort of understanding scientific knowledge, it seems that some kind of what we might call epistemic humility often seems justified, where we take some kind of attitude um, that's aware of the limits of our own understanding and aware of the limits of what science can actually sort of prove and show beyond a reasonable doubt, right? There are things that science can't do, um, and then there are things that science does very well. And we, you know, you need to actually study up on the science in order to figure out those sorts of things. But so here, even, you know, something along the lines of like a minimal amount of skepticism can be uh, justified for because, you know, science is hard and people get it wrong sometimes. However, when it comes to common knowledge, the things that we know in our everyday lives, it just seems like it's everywhere and everyone has it, right? You know what you look like. You know what your mother's name is. You know what you had for breakfast this morning and that you brush your teeth. Uh, you know how to get to the nearest grocery store. These uses of the word to know and the kinds of knowledge that accompanies them seem simple and basic and easy to have. And so skepticism, the idea that no one ever has knowledge or knowledge doesn't exist or that you know it's really hard to get knowledge, um, any kind of skepticism of a broad sort seems to be bound for failure simply because it seems to misuse the word knowledge when it comes to you know not recognizing that there are all these common cases if if the skeptic wants to say oh yeah but do you really know how to get to the grocery store you, you want to say yeah yes clearly i do i you're you're misusing that word you're trying to put some emphasis on that word that isn't there um sure maybe i don't know 
that there are subatomic particles because I can't see them or something like that. But that doesn't mean I don't know how to get to the grocery store. That's an easy case. So in rejecting this sort of outlandish kind of skepticism that seems a little bit too extreme, um, most people are willing to accept what we might call the standard view of knowledge. The standard view of knowledge is uh, sort of what an everyday person probably accepts. One, that we tend to know a lot of things, right? There's lots of things that we know. Of course, there are lots of things that we don't know, but we tend to know a lot of things. And that there are a number of different ways by which we can gain knowledge, a number of different ways of knowing. Um, now, a normal person might not be like have these things top of mind, but at least they could you know agree with some of these cases. Uh, in particular, ways of knowing are things like you know perception, you can perceive things, memory, you can remember things, testimony, people can tell you things, and you can come to know that way. Introspection, where you know you sort of think internally about your own states of mind, your own thoughts, your own feelings. Reasoning, uh, you can you know do some, you can sit and you can actually do some logic or reason from evidence to a conclusion, um, and maybe rational intuition or insight, where uh, in, in some t sometimes it seems like we're able to just um, come to know or understand certain things simply by kind of peering into them, <laughs> you know, mentally, uh, without actually doing a whole lot of reasoning. The standard view is the kind of thing that we should probably accept uh, on the whole uh, as regular human individuals, and I think philosophy kind of pans this out. Um, there are, of course, other challenges to this view, the view that we commonly know a lot of things and that there are these basic, like certain ways, different ways of knowing, many ways of knowing. Um, and the other, you know, the, the, the other challenges besides skepticism are what we might think of as relativism, nihilism, and scientism. However, uh, I think, again, Whatever it is that knowledge is, whatever it is that we think we're talking about when we're talking about whether or not we know things or what we know or who knows what or how knowledge works, it does seem like there's some pretty clear cut rules to the game, which we'll go into. The rules, you know, things that requirements that must be met in order to count as knowing. Um, and if there are rules to the game that, you know, requirements that must be met in order to count as knowing, then it's not just a free-for-all. And so relativism is out. Relativism would be like, look, the, the rules are, to the game are just made up and n none of the points matter, right? Like anyone can, anyone can know whatever they want, however they want, in whatever way they want. That seems wrong. There seem to be some pretty strict rules that we'll go into. Um, and so relativism seems problematic. Um, similarly, nihilism seems problematic because it seems like clearly we're talking about something when we're talking about knowing things, when we're talking about knowledge itself. Um, and nihilism is basically just the view that there is no such thing as knowledge, right? Knowledge doesn't exist. And so that, that would be crazy. Like, how could something that we're talking about, like knowing something, do not exist? And how could you even be a nihilist? Because in being trying to be a nihilist would be, to, like, would be like saying that you know that nothing exists, or you know that knowledge doesn't exist, which is just dumb. Um, similarly, scientism. Scientism is a kind of a kind of challenge to the standard view that um, is more and more popular these days. But people are confused, I think, um, because it's just kind of dumb to think that all knowledge comes from science and can only be gotten by doing science. Um, if if by if by science all you mean is like doing rational reflection and collecting evidence, then sure, <laughs> right? Maybe you're right. All knowledge is got by that, but that's not science like when we're talking about science we're talking about usually empirical data collecting experimentation but there's lots of knowledge that doesn't come by means of that sort of thing um science is great science is you know where all of our greatest achievements in knowledge come from where all of our greatest breakthroughs come from but that but that but we shouldn't sort of blindly give all of our allegiance over to science as if it's like the new religion this leads us to the traditional analysis of knowledge. Now, an analysis uh, is basically a kind of thing where you try to take some concept and break it down into its underlying subconcepts. You try and f analyze the larger concept and show how the subconcepts kind of fit together in order to make the bigger concept up. Knowledge, as we recognize it, is what we might call propositional. 
Meaning that when you know something, usually in particular uh, cases, what you know is a proposition. So we usually use these, this sort of turn of phrase, you know, Sally knows that the sky is blue, right? Here, the phrase that the sky is blue expresses a proposition or statement, and there's information that's in, in sort of in that, in that sentence, in that, in that phrase. There's information that's expressed, and the information expressed there by the phrase that the sky is blue is what Sally knows in this case, right? The sentence, Sally knows that the sky is blue, expresses a relationship that holds between Sally and this bit of information, right, that the sky is blue. The same kind of knowledge, the same proposition, the same bit of information can be known by a number of different people, basically anyone that's in the same position that Sally is with respect to how Sally came to know, right? So, you know, Sally could see that the sky is blue or somebody could tell her that the sky is blue or maybe Sally remembers that the sky is blue. Um, these are all ways of knowing and uh, ways of knowing these propositions, ways of knowing these bits of information. It doesn't matter, you know, like if, you know, that Sally speaks English or German or, you know, whatever, the information is the same uh, even if you express it differently by speaking different languages. Um, and so ultimately though, what we, where, where this comes down on is that knowledge statements come basically, for the most part, of the, in, in the form uh, S knows that P, where we're talking about a subject S and P a proposition. And basically for any pro proposition that you want to stick in there, any sentence is gonna, is gonna do fine. Now, in order to sort of give a good analysis on the basis of thinking about knowledge in terms of these S knows that P type sentences, what we want to know is when sentences of this form are true. Um, well, and basically what, what, what that means is like, what is it that makes sentences of this form true? Right? We've got, we've got this, these sentences distilled down, right? We've, we've taken the proposition out because it doesn't really matter what is what what the proposition is if someone knows it then great like that they stand in a certain relationship to that proposition that a bit, a bit of information and we've taken the subject out right we don't we don't need it's not the case that a particular individual needs to be in this sentence in order for um, us to understand what it is for someone to know something but what we want is to know what it is that makes it true that s knows that p for any basic person and proposition right and um so what we're looking for are the conditions under which these kinds of sentences come out true. So basically we're looking for what's called the truth conditions of sentences of the form S knows that P. And to do this, we need to think about uh, basic cases, right? So think about particular cases that you, you know, have come across where it's clear as day to you that people know things and start to try and piece together what's similar about those cases and then also think about cases in which people don't know things and what's similar about those cases and then try and compare and contrast them so what exactly are some situations where people claim to know things but you aren't so sure that they do right like let's think about like political pundits or internet posts right or your uncle's weird raving rants uh, these kinds of cases are situations in which someone says they know something but you're pretty much like eh, do you? Suppose we come across a case in where someone claims to know something, but that thing turns out to be demonstrably false. Did they really know that thing? Right? Take this. Take the take the case of Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus knew that by sailing west he would reach India. Or Donald Trump. Donald Trump knew that he was going to win the 2020 election. Now both of these cases can't really be cases of knowledge right because they're wrong right um christopher columbus couldn't reach india by sailing west i mean he would have had to sail west and south and then back north and you know he he couldn't he from where he left he was gonna hit a whole continent between you know him and india and donald trump didn't know that he was going to win the 2020 election because he didn't he lost the 2020 election so it seems that you know in order to know something you can claim that you know something, but if it's not true, if it doesn't actually occur, if the bit of information that you say you know isn't actually the case, isn't a fact, then you don't know it, 
So the information or proposition, it seems, in order to know it, must be true. Now, normally, when we see people that fail to know something that they, you know, were thinking was true, we don't attribute knowledge to them, right? When, we, when someone fails to know something, we don't say, oh, they knew that. Of, of course not, right? Because they failed to know. But we do see that they are kind of taking a commitment, st taking a standpoint, taking a, you know, trying to commit themselves to the thing that they are thinking, the particular bit of information, the proposition that they had before them, right? They, they thought that that proposition was true, and that's why they, you know, claimed to know it. Now, what exactly is this position where someone takes a stance or an attitude towards a bit of information, but, you know, maybe they don't actually know it in the end? Well, this state we generally call the state of belief, right? Um, believing is the kind of thing in which a person takes a stance towards the truth of a bit of information, um, you know, whether or not that information is actually true or not, right? They, be they believe that information. So the following, you know, two statements seem to be true, given the previous page. Christopher Columbus believed that by sailing west, he would reach India. And Donald Trump believed that he would win the 2020 election. They were both wrong, but it's true to say that they believed these things. Now, belief seems to be the kind of thing that's also a requirement for knowledge. You can take sort of, and you can see this by thinking about uh, cases where people sort of don't really fully believe something, uh, but you know they're in the vicinity of belief. So take things like cases like sports prediction. So suppose we say, uh, you know, a couple years ago, Scott knew that the Lakers were going to win the championship. Now. Supposing that the Lakers did eventually win, could Scott really have known that the Lakers were going to win the championship, pre like you know, back in the day? Um, now maybe you know it, it, it is true. It, it's true that's, that that the Lakers did win, and maybe Scott had some good reasons for thinking that they would win. But did Scott really take a full-on truth stance with respect to the proposition that the Lakers would win? The championship did he really know uh before like could anyone really have known before it actually happened probably he couldn't and the reason is because there's something like a difference between believing something and hoping that that thing is true right and one of the ways that we can tell this difference oftentimes is by taking stock in what people are betting, how, be, how people might bet, or how people might act with respect to information that they have. So question, how much are you willing to bet on what your mother's name is, right? Um, what you think it is, right? Um, versus how much are you willing to bet on who will win the next Super Bowl, right? Um, you probably have a vastly different betting scheme here you're probably willing to take any bet if someone thinks that you know like they know your mom's name better than you uh you better take that bet right because that's absurd you you know what your mom's name is um the other person might as well but you know that's like you would feel like you were being tricked or something right you you're pretty like certain you're, you're like a hundred percent right you're, you're very committed to the truth of the proposition that your mom's name is you know whatever karen <laughs> but for any football team who's going to win the next super bowl like this that's totally up in the air you might have like all the faith in the world for your team right that they're going to do it they're going to pull it off but do you can you even get to the point at which you believe that they're going to win um can you really fully commit to the truth there in the same way that you can commit to the truth that you know your that you know that of what, of what you believe your mom's name to be Having faith that some proposition is true is different than believing that that proposition is true. You might be committed to the truth of a proposition, say, you know, that God exists or, uh, you know, that, yeah, that, that Donald Trump will lose the next election, something like that. But you're going to act differently in cases of faith 
than in cases of belief, right? Beliefs are certain kinds of truth-aimed commitments. You, you actually commit yourself to the piece of information in a belief, whereas hope or faith are truth-aimed. You know, you hope that something comes to pass, you have faith that something is currently true, even if you don't, uh, you know, have full access to all the information. But the level of commitment is different for each of these, right? Especially for beliefs in, in comparison to hopes and faith. Um, now, sometimes people overcommit to things that are false. That is, they overcommit to their hopes or overcommit to their faith. Um, and so they end up having beliefs in these things that where they, where they shouldn't where they really should, right? This is where we get things like hopeful, wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is like where you start to believe that something's gonna happen. You know, like say you're, you're you know, you're a, uh, a gambler and you're like, oh, it, you know, it's my turn. I'm, I'm gonna win the next one. The next one, the next one's for me, on, on me. What you shouldn't, you shouldn't be taking that hope, that desire to win and turning it into a, a real belief, right? It, it, it just doesn't, it's just not gonna live up, live up to your expectations. Um, but, but, but ultimately, the idea here is just to, just to point out that what it is to be committed to a piece of information when you hope that it's true or when you have faith that it's true is different than being committed to a piece of information when you believe that it's true. So now we've got truth and belief as requirements for knowledge. But is that all? Is, it tr is, is true belief enough? When you have a belief, you're committed to the truth of something, and it's true. Is that enough to know? Well, suppose you come to believe something after being hit on the head, and that thing just turns out to be true, right? So like, bang, you get smacked on the head by a falling apple, <laughs> and all of a sudden you inexplicably believe that the moon is on average 384,400 uh, kilometers distant from Earth. That is true. Did you just stumble onto a piece of knowledge? It seems very unlikely that that counts as knowledge. Cases of luck, where you come to have a true belief, show that we need more than just true belief in order to know. If in this case it counts as, you know, you know just true belief counts as knowledge, then lucky true belief should count as knowledge as well. But we don't want to say that a person that simply, you know, comes to have a true belief by random chance, that they actually know what it is that they believe in this case, right? Um, we need good reasons for holding the beliefs that we have. And good reasons for the beliefs that we have are called justifiers or justifying reasons. And when a belief is held on the basis of good reasons, and we don't have defeaters for those reasons, we don't have other reasons for thinking that those reasons are bad reasons, then we have what's called a justified belief. Beliefs are justified by justifiers, and justified beliefs come about when a belief is all things considered more, you know, there are better reasons for believing it than not. Sadly, however, sometimes we have justified beliefs but they're not true. Uh, you know, imagine any situation in which you've had a good reason to believe something, but it's turned out to not be the case, right? Suppose you read a time on an invitation to a party just before, uh, and you know, you, you, you end up going to the party at that time, but you read the time on the invitation on the Evite or whatever, right before the host changed the time and resent out a bunch of inv invitations. You get to the party, you think it's at starts at seven, but it doesn't. Well, in this case, it seems like you had a good reason for believing that the party started at seven. You had a justified belief that the party started at seven, but it was false because, you know, somebody changed the time of the party. Uh, now, in this case, you know, you're in some sense not really at fault for your false belief, but, you know, because you had a good reason for thinking and it's the kind of, you know, bit of an, it's, it's the kind of reason that we all recognize as a good reason for believing what you believe. You had a justified belief, but it wasn't enough. Now there's a bit of a difference between being justified in having your having a belief, that is like having a reason for your belief, and being able to show that you're actually justified 
in a belief that you have. Being able to show that you're justified involves proving that the reason that you have for your belief is actually a good reason for your belief. Now, that's those are two separate things. Simply having a good reason and being able to show that it is a good reason are, you know, very, very different. Sometimes we believe things on the basis of good reasons that we are ultimately unaware of. But those reasons don't go away. They still exist. Sometimes they are still good reasons. And sometimes those good reasons still confer justification. So we're still justified in the beliefs that we have, even if we're unable to point out or explain why it is that the reasons that we're relying on are really good reasons. Think about this kind of case. Why in the end do you trust the deliverances of your visual perception, what you see? Is it because you're aware that your visual perception is a reliable source of the truth? Well, maybe, but you couldn't, and you probably don't think about that very often. And it's really doubtful that you could show how this is, right? Very few people are actually perceptual science experts and are able to sort of show how it is that, you know, the light patterns reflecting off your retina and the way that your brain works is actually like a good representation of reality outside the world and so reliable as a source of information and knowledge. Like, that's crazy, right? But those are all good reasons that, for thinking, you know, that, that are sort of in the background, behind, the, uh, behind your thinking that you know, what you see is what is out there in the world, right? When you see the red ball bouncing, uh, right? You can trust your perceptual uh, apparatus to, 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 to represent the red ball bouncing. Um, but, and, and you know, you're, you're justified in your belief that the red ball is bouncing on the basis of seeing it. Even if you don't know or are unable to prove behind the scenes how all of that justificatory story works. Justification, or sometimes called warrant, is a rather complex issue. There's lots of facets and interesting ins and outs where thinking about what exactly it is to have a good reason for a belief that you have. Epistemologists pretty much, you know, focus on the nature of justification when they're thinking about knowledge and try to figure out what exactly it is to have a good reason for believing something. In the rest of this sort of section, we're going to be talking a lot about different theories and kinds of justification. Ultimately, though, the sort of first thing we need to ask is whether or not now we've got an adequate analysis of knowledge. Is it really the case that just having justified true beliefs, is that enough for us to count as knowing something? If I have a belief in something and it's true and I have a good reason for believing it, is that it? Does that count as knowledge? Or do we also need something else? According to uh, Edmund Gettier, justified true belief is not enough for knowledge. And he gives a number of counterexamples, which we will look at in the next video.